Hello, uh, everyone, and welcome to Mayor Brown's webinar entitled Recent Trends in Litigating Willful Patent Infringement. My name is Lisa Ferry. I'm the co-chair of Mayor Brown's Global Intellectual Property Group. I'm joined today by my partners, Brian Nolan and Manuel Velez. Both are partners in Mayor Brown's Intellectual Property Group as well. The three of us focus our practices on patent strategy and litigation, representing clients in a variety of industries and technologies. Next slide, please. Today, we will be discussing some of the recent trends that we've been seeing in our practices on the subject of willful patent infringement and enhanced damages. In particular, we'll be addressing the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Halo Electronics v. Pulse Electronics and its subsequent interpretations by various courts, the knowledge requirement in the willfulness assessment, and trends emerging in recent cases, uh, and in particular, some strategies utilized by both plaintiffs and defendants. Now, before we begin, I'd like to just mention a few housekeeping announcements. If you have any questions during the presentation, I invite you to let us know via the chat feature. Simply type your question and we'll do our best to address the questions at the conclusion or even after today's program. Regarding CLE credit, we'll provide an alphanumeric code during this presentation. In order to receive CLE credit, participants must record this code and return the CLE form within 10 days of the event to Mayor Brown. These instructions are on the form that you have received from us. Lastly, please note that our slide presentation will be available to attendees also through the link provided via registration. Uh, so with that said, let's get started. I'm going to turn the floor over to my partner, Manuel Velez. Thanks, Lisa. So if you're joining us today, you probably appreciate that HALO changed the legal landscape for willful infringement. And the most important change was that HALO did away with the rigid objective tests established by Seagate. Instead, HALO proposed a more flexible inquiry that focuses on the subjective belief of the accused infringer. The analysis now focuses on the accused infringer's knowledge and intent at the time of the alleged infringement. HALO also lowered the standard of proof from clear and convincing evidence to a preponderance of the evidence. With respect to enhanced damages, the Supreme Court stated that they should not be awarded in the typical infringement case. Instead, enhanced damages should be awarded as a punitive sanction for egregious deliberate bad behavior. A central question after HALO was how would judges and juries apply the flexible inquiry set out by HALO? To explore this question, we're going to take a look at some empirical data. Next slide, please. So in the next few slides, we're going to take a look at data from district court decisions on willfulness between 2010 and 2020. This encompasses decisions issued about five and a half years before HALO and four and a half years after HALO. The data consists of decisions in cases in where there was a pleading of willfulness and, decision, and a decision on the merits, either through summary judgment or at trial. After HALO, many legal commentators predicted that willfulness findings would increase, and the data has validated this prediction. Uh, before HALO, willfulness was found in 37% of the cases. After HALO, Willfulness was found in 65% of the cases. Uh, this reflects an increase of about 28%, which is statistically significant. And if you look at the pie charts, there are almost reverse mirror images of each other. Next slide. Legal commentators also predicted that enhanced, dam enhanced damages findings would increase after HALO, but this prediction has not been fully validated by the data. Here, we're looking at district court decisions where there was a willfulness finding, and then a determination of whether enhanced damages should be awarded. Generally, enhanced damages were awarded in cases where the accused infringer was motivated to harm the patent holder, the accused infringer copied the patent holder's patents, 
and or the accused infringer engaged in litigation misconduct. Before HALO, enhanced damages were awarded in about 60% of the cases. After HALO, enhanced damages were awarded in 69% of the cases. While this reflects an increase of about 9%, it is not statistically significant. And what this means is that the increase could be due by chance. Next slide, please. In this graph, uh, we're comparing the willfulness outcomes of bench and jury trials. Uh, before HALO, judges found willfulness in 8% of bench trials. After HALO, judges found willfulness in 26% of bench trials. This reflects an increase of 18%, which is statistically significant. While the trend is similar for jury trials, the results are not as pronounced. Uh, before HALO, juries found willfulness in 79% of jury trials. After HALO, juries found willfulness in 86% of the trials. Uh, while this reflects an increase of 7%, it is not statistically significant. Collectively, what this means is that after HALO, judges are finding willfulness more frequently than before HALO. In contrast, after HALO, juries are finding willfulness at about the same rate as before HALO. Next slide, please. Uh, next, we're going to look at the likelihood of resolving a willfulness claim at the summary judgment stage. Uh, in the four and a half years before HALO, about 40% of all willfulness decisions were resolved by summary judgment. In the four and a half years after HALO, about 17% of all willfulness decisions were resolved by summary judgment. Uh, this reflects a 23% decrease of pretrial resolution of willfulness after HALO. Uh, while there was not enough data for statistical analysis, this trend shows that after HALO, judges are less likely to decide willfulness on summary judgment than before HALO. In other words, after HALO, willfulness claims appear more likely to be resolved at trial. Uh, next slide. This table shows the impact of venue uh, in willfulness findings. Uh, the table includes data from the seven districts that had saw the most willfulness decisions from 2010 to 2020. Uh, while there was not enough data for statistical analysis, we do want to highlight some trends that are interesting. Uh, in five districts, uh, willfulness increased after HALO, and these are the Central District of California, the Eastern District of Texas, the Northern District of Illinois, the Northern District of California, and the District of Delaware. In some instances, the increases were rather dramatic. For example, in CD Cal, uh, the increase was about 66 percent, and in the Eastern District of Texas, it was about 54 percent. Uh, in one district, the District of Massachusetts, there does not appear to be a change in the percentage of willfulness findings. And in another district, the Southern District of, in, of New York, uh, willfulness findings decrease slightly. These trends are useful to keep in mind when thinking about venue for a case involving willfulness claims. If you're a patent holder, you may want to bring suit in CD Cal, the Eastern District of Texas, or the Northern District of Illinois, which have the highest percentages of willfulness findings after HALO. If you are an accused infringer, you may wanna have your case litigated in the Southern District of New York or the District of Delaware, which have the lowest percentages of willfulness findings after HALO. Next slide. Now we're going to shift gears and talk about how district courts and the federal circuit have interpreted HALO. Next slide. As I mentioned previously, uh, the Supreme Court in HALO stated that damages should not be awarded in the typical infringement case. Uh, instead, the court noted that enhanced damages should be awarded as a punitive sanction for egregious, deliberate, bad faith behavior. Some district courts have used this language in their willfulness analysis. Uh, for example, in the case of Variant Medical v. Electa, Judge Burke in the District of Delaware granted a motion to dismiss willfulness, willful infringement claims because the complaint did not sufficiently articulate how the alleged infringement amounted to an egregious case of patent infringement. In contrast, another judge in the same district arrived at a different conclusion. Uh, judge Noriega, in the case of APS Tech v. Vertex, found that a patent holder is not required to plead acts of egregiousness. Instead, the court found that egregiousness is a necessary element to enhancing damages under HALO and not the willfulness analysis. Uh, next slide. 
Case law from the federal circuit lends support to the interpretation that wanton conduct was necessary to establish willfulness. Uh, in the Bayer v. Bexalta case, uh, the district court granted the accused infringer's motion for judgment as a matter of law of no willful infringement. Uh, on appeal, the federal circuit affirmed, uh, noting that the record was insufficient to establish that the accused infringer's conduct rose to the level of wanton, malicious, and bad faith behavior required for willful infringement. Next slide, please. Last year, uh, the Federal Circuit clarified the standard for willful infringement in the SRI Bicisco case. Uh, to understand why the Federal Circuit clarified the standard, it's important to know some key events in the procedural history of the case. In SRI, the jury found willful infringement and the court awarded enhanced damages. On appeal, the Federal Circuit vacated and remanded the case. On remand, the district court interpreted the Federal Circuit's opinion as requiring a more stringent standard for willful infringement. In other words, conduct rising to the level of wanton, malicious, and bad faith behavior. Uh, relying on this standard, the district court granted the accused infringer's motion for judgment as a matter of law of no willful infringement. On appeal, the Federal Circuit reversed and found that substantial evidence supported the jury's finding of willful infringement. And in reversing, the Federal Circuit clarified that the language in HALO concerning wanton, malicious, and bad faith conduct refers to conduct warranting enhanced damages and not conduct warranting a finding, a finding of willfulness. Next slide, please. So what are the practical implications of the Federal Circuit's clarification of the standard for willful infringement? Well, it's going to be interesting to see if the Federal Circuit's clarification will lead to even more willfulness findings. Uh, the SRI decision is less than 10 months old, so we don't have enough data points yet to determine the impact of the decision. However, in the short term, there are things that patent holders and accusing infringers should be doing. Uh, patent holders should scrutinize the information that is put before the jury. For example, patent holders should make sure that the jury instructions on willful infringement do not contain the terms like egregious or pirate-like, which suggests a heightened standard. For their part, accused infringers should refocus their efforts by arguing that there is no basis for enhanced damages based upon the wanton and pirate standard. Uh, for example, we have seen several courts have used summary judgment to remove willfulness from a jury because the evidence supporting enhancement does not suffice. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Brian Nolan. And I think, Brian, you're on mute. Thank you, Manuel, for that background. So now we're going to switch over to discussion of the knowledge requirement that Manuel laid out, which is one component of willful infringement. And as Manuel had discussed with respect to the standards that were applied for willfulness, we also see that district courts are applying a different standard when it comes to knowledge uh, that supports a willfulness claim. Next slide, please. And so there are two uh, aspects about this. Uh, the question really becomes, must a defendant uh, have knowledge of the, each individual patent of the asserted patents, or does general knowledge of the patents suffice? Now, when we look at this, some courts hold that specific knowledge is not required, and the test is to look at the totality of the circumstances. And in fact, uh, in this Illumina case, which is fairly recently issued, uh, the district court had discussed that the federal circuit precedent did not lay down a per se rule with respect to what's required about knowledge. And it felt that totality of the circumstances, you could bring in all this different evidence that would support a finding that uh, the patentee had the requisite knowledge to support the fact that the infringement would be intentional. Uh, that is not the case in all instances. So we have seen courts where they have rejected arguments of customary industry practice to show pre-suit knowledge or found knowledge uh, based on licensing agreements. Uh, in the uh, Plexicon case, again, another very recent case, the, the uh, patentee had argued that Standard practice in the industry was to do due diligence. Standard practice in the industry was to understand what your competitor products and patents were, and that could build into the totality of the circumstances. And the court rejected that as a basis for knowledge uh, when they looked at it, and they said that did not provide sufficient pre-suit knowledge. Uh, in, a, in this um, 
and Crystal case that issued in this year, again, the court had rejected the argument that the uh, alleged infringer had pre-suit knowledge because the evidence showed while it was aware of licensing agreements that covered the asserted patents, and they were aware of applications that issued as that in that patent family, that was insufficient as a matter of law to show pre-suit knowledge. And so Judge Andrews did not accept that standard. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, separate and apart from the totality of circumstances and specific knowledge, we also see a disagreement in district courts on what is required when you talk about whether you have to have possessed knowledge before the filing of the lawsuit or can post-suit knowledge suffice. Uh, some district courts in this Merrill case had discussed that, that some district courts were grappling with whether HALO had abrogated Seagate's focus on pre-suit knowledge. Uh, in this Merrill case, the judge concluded that uh, a less rigid standard should be applied, that you may be able to look at post-suit knowledge. And in that case, they found uh, the, the knowledge could come through the amended complaint and they did not uh, grant a, uh, a motion to dismiss the willfulness claim in that in that instance. And similarly, in this Exigen case, the court, uh, again, recognizing that there was some uh, dis disputes between court on what's required. In this case, in Delaware, the judge found that uh, post-suit knowledge may suffice, although that fact may go to enhancement. Uh, on the other side, we see courts that have said, no, pre-suit litigation and pre-suit conduct is where we focus on and pre-suit knowledge is required uh, as we see in the power um, integration case. Uh, and then similarly in this very recent um, Zapfroid case, which was in the last year or so, Judge Conley recognized the distinction and actually recognized and that the, his own uh, district, Delaware, had different opinions on it. And in this case, he granted no, uh, he, he did not allow a willfulness claim to go forward because he felt the complaint was an avenue by which you were able to remedy problems and not a, uh, a basis to create causes of action. Next slide. Uh, so this ambiguity uh, may matter because when, when companies do due diligence or look at new products that they may want to launch, you have to be careful because if you identify these patents, does that go into the totality of circumstances that Illumina discussed that you had knowledge? We also see several cases of recent vintage where they, they accept that you can get knowledge from third parties. You may get knowledge from in the Illumina case from the company that you were dealing with or may, may have acquired. And similarly, uh, in this, in this um, Arjuna case, the knowledge came from a customer of the, of the alleged infringer. So you have to consider that when doing your due diligence. So can we go to the next slide? So what does this practically mean? The practice is we have to be careful when we do this due diligence because we don't want to get the requisite knowledge. Uh, this, this Olaf suit design case is interesting because in this case, the, the defendant acquired a company and the court in that say, case said, that there was no evidence that the due diligence was significant enough to identify the patents. There was a representation warranty against infringement. Um, and even the fact that the, the patent prosecuting counsel for the defendant may have had knowledge, there was no evidence that would be imputed to the defendant to support knowledge. Uh, but you have to be careful with those arguments because we identify this CAVE consulting case, uh, which was dealing with sham litigations, but disagreed with much of the analysis that Olaf had presented. Um, and another thing when you're doing due diligence is consider what you're looking at. Are you looking at um, the patents that are actually asserted in the case or the applications? And I think Lisa will discuss that in a little more detail later. So that is one, another area where we have disputes on what, how courts are applying uh, uh, knowledge and willfulness and a disagreement. If we can go to the next slide, now we're gonna transition the discussion into what are we seeing in recent trends? Uh, what are patentees arguing to support their willfulness claim and to support their enhancement claim? And how are defendants responding to that? I'm gonna deal with the former point focused on patentees. Lisa's gonna pick up on that and then move into the defendants responses. So if we can go to the next slide. One thing that we see oftentimes is that a, defend, a patentee points to past business relationships. And they say through these past business relationships, they clearly would have knowledge of the patents. And with that knowledge, they can't say that their infringement was not intentional. 
Uh, this had come up in the recent Sagan v. Daiichi, Daiichi case. A Sagan alleged that it had its past business relationship with Daiichi, and that provided notice of the patent application that issued at the, as the patent. And the jury found that that was sufficient to support a willful infringement claim. And what's interesting here is when you look at the court decision, and particularly the finding of fact 24, they said the, that, that the prior collabor collaboration and former licensee of the patent family was sufficient to provide DSC uh, was already aware of the patent portfolio. So again, this is a broader application of knowledge. It's not specific to the patent, but it said you were aware of the patent family. And so this prior business relationship was used as a basis to show knowledge and support a jury's verdict of uh, willful infringement. Next slide, please. Similar to uh, past business relationships, what we see often patentees arguing is attempts to license. And uh, in this slide, we discuss where the attempt to license was used in two instances. One, it was used as a basis to support a willfulness claim. And then the second one, we're seeing it where the uh, patentee is using it as a basement to support the enhancement, the second part of the analysis that Manuel has discussed with. So in the Juno case, when uh, the patent, the, the, the jury had found willful infringement, and the uh, defendant had moved for judgment as a matter of law of absent willful infringement. So in considering whether there was evidence for the jury to rely upon, the district court specifically pointed to the attempts to license. And they said those attempts to license can support a willfulness claim and support the jury's finding that there was willfulness and an intent to infringe. You should understand that this Juno case has been reversed on the written description analysis that came out of the Federal Circuit last year. So the willfulness claim was vacated, but it was vacated for a different reason. Uh, and now if we go to a very recent case, we all may have been aware of this uh, Rav, Rav Gen V Laboratory Corp case that just came out of a jury verdict in, the, in Texas in which we had a, a verdict of about $273 million. Uh, in, in their motions for enhanced damages, the jury, the court has not ruled on this, but uh, the patentee in this instance is relying heavily on the fact that they came, the defendant came for license and they made a conscious decision not to take the license and try their, um, try their uh, luck in court. And therefore that supports an enhancement. If we can go to the next slide. When Manuel discussed the analysis, one thing he pointed to, he said, copying evidence that you're trying to harm the patentee and litigation misconduct, there are strong basis for willfulness and particularly for enhancing. And what we have seen is copying, if a patentee can present copying, copying is a very difficult argument for a patent, uh, an alleged infringer to deal with from a willfulness perspective. Uh, and so you're going to see this as much as you as is possibly can, patentees are gonna put this forward. In the Kite case that we had just talked about, uh, the judge pointed to the fact that the evidence showed that the, the defendant's collaborator early on had copied the backbone of the CAR T that formed the basis for the patent. And they said that was strong evidence and supported the jury's version of willfulness. Um, and then similarly, in the Illumina case, the court pointed to there was evidence of copying here. And that evidence of copying can support the jury's verdict. It can support the fact that there was an intentional act of infringement here. So copying is a very big component. You're always going to see it if the patentee can string anything together to support an allegation that there's copying, that's going to come forward and it's gonna be compelling if the evidence is supportive. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. And so what do we see when we talk about, uh, how do you prove up copying? How do you prove up, um, the, the defendant knew about the technologies. And we see the most compelling evidence that uh, patentees can offer is they comb through the defendant's documents and they look for any relationship to their technology, any way that they can argue, look, they knew about the technology, their own documents admit it, their own documents acknowledge they copied it. Uh, and so we saw a great example of this in the Illumina decision that came out this year. In this decision, the court went through great lengths in, in denying the JMOL to look at it. And he looked at the deposition testimony confirming the company's knowledge and confirming potential copying and attempts to reverse engineer. 
And specifically, they looked at the documents. And in the documents they went through and they found documents that said that the defendant had ruled out the possibility of using azide chemistry or didn't want to touch anything with azoid chemistry, so on and so forth. And those things, they said, that showed knowledge and intent to copy when they finally did go that route. If we can go to the next slide. Um, the another thing that we often see patentees doing it is looking at unsuccessful attempts for a, PT, uh, a PGR or a, um, an IPR proceeding. And the patentees will point that and said, once you failed to invalidate at the PTAB, you really didn't have a reasonable basis to go forward and not have intentional infringement. Um, and we see this that this works. In the Juno case, the Juno case, the fact that the defendant had challenged the patents at the PTAB and failed, again, the judge said, that's a basis that the jury could rely upon to say that this was intentional infringement. That supports the jury's verdict of willfulness. Uh, and in another case, which is interesting, it's a little older, the, this Dexaquan case, which is, uh, is, is interesting, because in that case, the judge allowed um, evidence related to the denial of institution to go to the jury. Uh, the court recognized that there was a dispute uh, or it split among district courts whether you can allow the fact that PTAB proceedings existed to go, go before the jury. But this, this court felt that the fact that the institution had been denied, that was a decision that was different, and that any issues associated with the different legal standards that would be applied could be dealt with in a jury instruction. And then if we can turn to the next slide. And now, this is not something that uh, we, we see defendants don't, excuse me, patentees don't normally bring in the fact that opinion exists if they can avoid it. They'd rather not deal with that. But when they are confronted with an opinion, what we see the defensive posture is that the opinion was unreliable or that the, the uh, patent, the defendant did not reasonably rely upon it. They didn't use it. And so a good example is this applied medi um, medi um, medical resource case. And in this case, there were three opinions. And when the Federal Circuit looked at it, and they looked at the argument that the opinions insulated the defendant from allegations of willful infringement, they said, for the first opinion, they said it was just, quote, unquote, shipped off in the mail, so they don't know if it was really used. The second opinion dealt with issues other than infringement and invalidity, so they didn't know that that was really germane. And the third opinion that was received that was more fulsome, but that was received after the product was already on the market, so it really couldn't have been used as a basis to decide whether you would go on the market. And similarly, in this Johns Hopkins case, we see uh, that Judge uh, Fallon, in, in her report and recommendation, she, she recommended denying summary judgment because she found that although there was an opinion, there were some questions. Questions that she raised was, there was some evidence that some people at the defendants disagreed with the conclusion of the opinion. There was also evidence that the opinion was not shared with the people that were responsible for designing the product. And so whether there was justifiable reliance could be questioned. And finally, she noted after they received the opinion that the defendant still sought a license from it. So that may question whether they really believe the opinion could be relied upon and there was justifiable reliance. Those were fact questions and that's why she suggested denying summary judgment. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague to discuss some other issues that patentees focus on and then how defendants can respond to those issues. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yes, I'm going to touch on some additional strategies that we're seeing uh, following the HALO decision out of the Supreme Court. A strategy adopted by patentees as the case moves to trial is to use a defendant's stipulation of infringement to support the plaintiff's willful infringement case. Uh, as one example, recently in the Idenix case in Delaware District Court, the plaintiff requested that the jury be instructed that the uh, defendant's infringement was a matter of fact. In other words, that it had been established as this is critical to the willful infringement proofs. Plaintiff also requested that it be allowed to reference the infringement in opening and closing arguments and during trial on the grounds that it's necessary to tell the jury that this predicate element of willful infringement has been met. Ultimately, uh, the court did not adopt this approach as we'll discuss uh, in a moment, but it did acknowledge Idenix predicament in moving 
forward in proving willful infringement. The approach was also used by plaintiffs in the recent Plexicon case, which uh, came out of the Northern District of California, where the patentee argued in opposition to the defendant's JMOL of no willfulness, that jurors reasonably could conclude that Novartis's stipulation of infringement shows that Novartis continued to act in the face of an objectively high likelihood of infringement. Now, as a, as a case note to that, despite Plexicon's arguments, the district court did grant JMOL of no willful infringement or enhanced damages. Uh, next slide, please. Now, from the opposite perspective, uh, an accused infringer should seek to minimize the impact of a stipulation of infringement by arguing for curative instructions to the jury. For example, in the Identix case that we just discussed, the defendant Gilead opposed Identix requests on the ground that it would be unduly prejudicial and requested that the court provide a short preliminary instruction to the jury that infringement is not an issue you are deciding in this case. Furthermore, they asked to uh, prohibit the opposing counsel from commenting or mentioning infringement during the trial on the basis that it had not been conceded, hadn't conceded infringement, and uh, nor the court's claim construction, which was subject to appeal. The court crafted an approach taking into consideration both requests being mindful of the possible prejudice to Gilead, uh, should the jury be misled into thinking uh, that they conceded it subjectively believes it infringes, the court instructed the jury that it was not an issue before them and to assume infringement and also provided some specific language that was to be used uh, in front of the jury. Next slide, please. Now, uh, as to the issue of knowledge, which um, Brian had, had discussed from the patentee perspective, an approach that defendants may utilize in arguing against plaintiff's attempts to show that defendant had the requisite knowledge of a patent and of infringement is to assert that any business interactions with the patentee that occurred before patent rights exist does not supply the appropriate knowledge post-HALO. In several recent decisions, courts have found pre-patent issuance dis uh, discussions of limited value to a plaintiff in supporting willfulness. For example, uh, in the SRI decision cited here, the Federal Circuit rejected the district court's enhanced damages award, finding the record supported the timeline that Cisco developed its own product and held business discussions with SRI before the patents existed. Now, in a recent Delaware District Court decision, uh, Bio Marier v. Hologic, the court found that knowledge gained during the business discussions of related patents or scientific public publications, in other words, the things that may lead to the patents ensued, that doesn't support the requisite knowledge for willfulness. Uh, the court reasoned that a party can't be liable for infringement, um, nor be liable for willful infringement uh, for a patent that doesn't yet exist. Next slide. Now, um, as a case moves to trial, an accused infringer may argue that evidence of conduct between the parties, for example, licensing discussions, prior to patent issuance would be unduly prejudicial in front of the jury. And in seeking exclusion of the evidence, uh, the accused infringer can point to Federal Rule of Evidence 403 in arguing that the prejudice outweighs any purported relevance. Courts generally have broad discretion to exclude prejudicial uh, evidence and with this discretion have limited the admission of pre-issuance conduct as having limited probative value. For example, um, in both the um, cited cases here, Arexo and Ovisys, cases um, there, the district court looked to rule 403 and excluding communications and negotiations between the parties prior to the patent issuing. However, 
um, as an exception to this general rule where the evidence shows egregious conduct, such as blatant copying, the evidence may be admitted as relevant to an infringer's state of mind. This was the situation in the cited Sonos case, uh, but the court did require specific proof that the alleged copying was egregious prior to allowing it in at trial. Now, negotiations and communications would not normally rise to that level of conduct. Next slide, please. Now, we noted earlier uh, that attempts to license may be used against an accused infringer by the patentee in supporting willfulness. However, a response to that argument may be made by the defendant by proffering evidence that a license was sought as a reasonable commercial practice, including as a way to avoid costly disruptive litigation. Some courts have rejected arguments that seeking a license shows a knowing or intentional infringement, and rather uh, have held that negotiations that ultimately result in no agreement may still demonstrate good faith and fair and reasonable commercial behavior. In the Fingen case, for example, the district court found that defendants' failure to play ball by accepting patentees' terms could be seen as demonstrating its belief in its own non-infringement arguments. Of course, uh, we need to keep in mind that pre-suit negotiations, once litigation is anticipated or probable, should be excluded from trial to the extent they're offered in contravention of Federal Rule of Evidence 408, under which courts may specifically exclude negotiations to the extent a party seeking to admit them to prove or disprove the validity of a claim in its amount. Next slide. In dealing with allegations of copying by a patentee, which we, we discussed previously, an accused infringer can counter these allegations by focusing on the timing and the context of its activities prior to patent issuance. For instance, um, where an accused infringer proffers evidence that it developed its product independently and prior to the issuance of the patents in suit, courts have found a lack of bad faith and the requisite intent to infringe. So, for example, in the BioVeritiv case in De out of, coming out of Delaware, Judge Andrews granted summary judgment of no willful uh, where the defendant's research and development took place well before the patent's priority date. Furthermore, in this BioVeritiv case, um, as an additional argument against copying allegations, the court found that defendant's actions pre-patent issuance could be described as competitive intelligence in the pharmaceutical industry rather than a plan to copy. Next slide, please. Now, we previously discussed the strategy of a patent holder trying to use a failed attempt to invalidate the patents in suit, um, such as through a, a post-grant challenge, as evidence of a lack of a good faith belief in the invalidity of the patents. To counter this tactic, an accused infringer should move to block the use of this evidence at trial. In fact, an accused infringer can point to a number of decisions, which we have cited here, in which courts have found that the probative value of an unsuccessful attempt to invalidate a patent in the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, or the PTAB, is outweighed by the prejudice to the alleged infringer. For example, in the Sysmex case, the court granted a motion in limine excluding any mention of a non-instituted IPR as not relevant and pre uh, presenting a risk of confusing the jury given the PTAB's differing standards approved from the district court. As the court in the Plexicon case stated, a PTAB decision declining to institute an IPR is not a decision on the merits any more than a decision to institute a proceeding is a decision on the merits. Next slide. Now, um, additional uh, approach by an accused infringer is to point to previous challenges, in particular to foreign counterparts 
patents as in fact supporting its good faith belief of the invalidity of the patents ensued. In fact, courts have viewed challenges to the validity of a patentee's portfolio as relevant to the accused infringer's subjective belief in the invalidity of the patents in suit, and therefore its state of mind uh, relating to intentional infringement. So in, in several recent Delaware decisions we've seen, including um, what's cited here, the Biomarier case, uh, Knox Medical, and SZ DJI Tech, the courts noted the challenges to foreign counterpart patents were supportive of the accused infringers' arguments of no willful infringement. It, for instance, in the SZ Tech case, the court denied a motion in limine attempting to exclude evidence of other legal proceedings in the US, Germany, and China, stating that it should come in at least during the willfulness stage as, a relevant, as being relevant to state of mind and subjective willfulness. Next slide. Now, um, in our post-HALO world, uh, opinions of counsel continue to have importance for an accused infringer regarding, for instance, state of mind. And it's still recommended that they should be obtained by a company confronted with a potential allegation of willful infringement. The, opin the opinion will uh, certainly serve as strong evidence supporting a lack of the requisite intent to infringe. A number of recent decisions, including the Federal Circuit's decision in Omega Patents, have found opinions highly probative evidence on good faith. In that case, the court remanded the case to the district court uh, on the basis that the district court should have admitted testimony uh, from both the uh, company witness uh, regarding his investigation and the outside lawyer concerning the substance of his analysis and opinion. Uh, as another example, in the recent Sunoco Partners decision, the Federal Circuit reiterated the continued relevance and importance of the advice of counsel defense to willful infringement, provided that, of course, the opinion letters competent when viewed under the totality of evidence. In that case, the district court had trebled the damages award, uh, having taken in, uh, issue with the competence and reliability of the opinion of counsel. The federal circuit vacated the decision and remanded, uh, having found the court uh, had abused its discretion after making a review of the attorney's testimony and opinion and finding that it was free of error. Uh, as another recent example, in the Plexicon case, the district court rejected plaintiff's argument that the opinion of counsel should be excluded on the basis that it was unreliable because the attorney had a history of working with the company. The court found this to be inadequate grounds to question its reliability and competence. And with that last slide, uh, this concludes today's webinar. Uh, we hope that this information that we shared with you today was useful. Um, we thank you for your participation. Um, and uh, because we do have time um, available now, um, we can turn to any questions that uh, uh, any of you have for us. Uh, Lisa, I think there are a few questions that mm -hmm. we have received. I think the first one would actually go to you, Manuel. I don't know that we have this information, but it asks, do we have any breakdown based on willfulness from technology if we look at it from a life sciences perspective or from a high tech perspective on whether we're seeing higher levels of willfulness in one of those areas compared to another? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And the data set that we looked at uh, were decisions that were collected and coded for either willfulness or non-willfulness and enhanced damages or not enhanced damages. Unfortunately, they did not break it down by technology, life sciences versus high tech. So we don't have information on, on that particular issue, but I, I would also be interested in, in knowing that. So, so we'll research that, but that's a good point. But also one thing I think, Manuel, from the slides that you saw, when we see particularly if any of these are going to the jury, 
with either high tech or life sciences, the technology usually is at a level that's higher than what the jury is used to dealing with. And we're seeing high levels of um, juries returning willfulness on the data that you, you turned on. So I think it's really going to show if you can show the copying that Lisa and I were discussing or others, that's going to drive it. I don't think it's going to be as industry or technology specific. I think mm -hmm. it's going to be the factors that we've already just discussed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one thing I might throw in there, and this would be a non-scientific non and anecdotal, was that we can glean at least perhaps some insights by the data Manuel showed on the various district courts. Because for instance, decisions in the district courts in Texas will more likely be high tech. There's not a lot of life sciences there. Um, and, you know, for instance, if, if we have Delaware or New Jersey statistics, we may have a higher uh, certainly number of life sciences uh, cases um, in comparison, for instance, with Texas or maybe even California. And a, a second question that we received, and again, I think it probably is associated with your topics, but I think any one of us could, could uh, speak on it is, Manuel, what is the value of a willfulness finding if at the end of the day, the judge is not going to enhance the damage or the judge decides not to enhance the damages? So the short answer is that it is of limited value. Uh, a willfulness finding is uh, required, but it's not sufficient for an enhanced damages analysis. Uh, you know, you need to show first that it was willful infringement, and then the court undertakes a separate analysis on whether to enhance damages, and it will use the read factors. Uh, and it, we have seen in some cases where the district court has said, you know what, there might be evidence of willful infringement, but as I looked at the read factors and enhanced damages, there's not going to be an award in enhanced damages, so I'm not even going to let the jury decide willful infringement. Uh, so, so the answer to your question, it would be of limited value uh, of finding a willful infringement if no enhanced damages are awarded. Mm -hmm. So if I could just maybe add kind of a, a, a bit of a, a data type uh, response as, this to well, as well, because I've seen just some of the statistics um, on cases um, in terms of looking at willfulness being involved in the case and, and not in terms of infringement. So maybe one thing as well to, to kind of glean from this is that when there is the willfulness issue um, brought to the jury, it's shown that it's much more likely that infringement will be found. So from a patentee or plaintiff's standpoint, um, you know, a, a going for willfulness and with hopes of getting the willfulness um, decision uh, from the from the court um, or the jury is very helpful wow. because you're getting those facts about about you know egregious factors um, that may be pointed to by the patentee on the on the uh, within the actions of the accused infringer and. The jury hearing that, for instance, about willfulness is more likely than to find infringement. So it may just from a strategy standpoint, from a patentee, you really want to um, get that before the, the jury. And of course, the accused infringer, you, you want to try and keep that away from the jury. And of course, that's where maybe the summary judgment of no willfulness comes in. No, yeah, I agree. The, the fact that you can use, as Manuel suggested, the no enhanced damages so the judge takes the willfulness away because it certainly is a vehicle by which all these kind of bad actor facts get put forward that we'd like to avoid. Uh, the next question that we have here is a question of, with respect to, um, should patentees be sending warning letters uh, to establish knowledge? Clearly, if you send a warning letter and it's pre-suit, you you take away this, this uh, ambiguity as to whether pre-suit knowledge suffices or the complaint itself is sufficient. Uh, you always still have to balance that with the declaratory judgment aspect about uh, whether giving notice somehow allows you to be brought into a court that you don't want to be in. But just from a willfulness perspective, whether giving notice uh, is sufficient. And remember, the notice here for declaratory judgment 
uh, may not be the same level. Normally, when we look at what's required for notice for damages to start running, there's more in alignment with that to maybe support a declaratory judgment jurisdiction. But there may be a way that you could give notice of the patent so that you can say you had notice of the patent and you, you continued forward without it, without triggering uh, the declaratory judgment jurisdiction. Clearly, it would the notice provides help from a willfulness perspective. You just have to balance it with the other factors in the case. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Lisa or Manuel, if you have any other thoughts on that. Well, I, you know, I, what I would add is that, you know, this is, it's an interesting question in light of the uh, split in a lot of the district courts and even within the district court, as Judge Connolly uh, in Delaware has pointed out in terms of, you know, whether or not um, the complaint itself is appropriate notice. So I would say that uh, it's really helpful for everyone, you know, in this field to keep their eyes uh, on the decisions as they come out. Um, certainly, it it's, can be, you know, jurisdiction uh, dependent. Uh, and as Judge Connolly mentioned, until the Federal Circuit comes out on this, we, we will have a, a bit of different opinion of what is the appropriate notice and what's the appropriate timing. And then swinging back, we have another comment on enhanced damages. So maybe Manuel or Lisa, you might want to provide some insight. It says, so the comment is, so we should focus on the enhance, enhancement aspect of the, of the judge and try to sway the jury away from willfulness but understanding that the game is won with the judge. So I think this goes to what you had pointed to earlier, Lisa, maybe you wanna comment further on that? Well, yes, certainly um, the, the uh, read factors, um, as Manuel mentioned in terms of the enhancement will go before the judge. And oftentimes um, after trial, um, you will have another mini hearing to present the evidence um, to the to the judge in terms of um, getting that uh, enhanced damages once you have um, you know swayed swayed the jury let's say in willfulness uh, and if you you know receive a willfulness finding yes it will be all up to the judge and um, you know depending again I think this is also um, uh, maybe you know, court uh, dependent and others in terms of what kind of assessment. And I think oftentimes we find at least that throughout the case, even at summary judgment, the judge will probably be giving you a bit of a hint along the way as to whether or not there's going to be enhancement. We saw from the from the statistics, it's it's still um, you know quite you know less less able to get that, let's say, under the, the numbers coming out of the courts. Yeah, I mean, I think the general takeaway is from a, from a defendant's perspective, you can do, do whatever you can to get willfulness out of the case because it really mm -hmm. clouds the jury's mind. And from the patentee's perspective, do whatever you can to keep it in because you really can get the jury going on this kind of bad actor concept, maybe to fold in some that may affect their infringement decisions or their invalidity decisions. Uh, so it's really, it, it's pretty stark on how people want this to be tried. If you're the alleged infringer, you do everything you can to get it out. And if you're the patentee, you do everything you can to get it in. Um, and I think we have one more question coming in here uh, that we I th we might have. Well, we have a few. Um, this maybe goes to you, Lisa. Um, it says, do you see the scope of what is excluded under 408 more narrow for willfulness purposes beyond everything is excluded after an NDA is in place when negotiating a license. So the balance is relying on NDAs to prevent stuff from coming into the court versus the balance of uh, just using 408 to keep uh, licensing discussions outside of the jury's uh, view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those two things, the NDA and you know having any kind of discussions under Rule 408 really do kind of cross over and, and dovetail. Um, certainly, but uh, of course, 408 would be more narrow uh, for willfulness um, because this is, you know, you're keeping something out to show the validity of the claim. Um, the NDA, certainly uh, we have seen in our experience, it's very important uh, about, um, you know, when it's entered into the spe specifics, you know, what's provided, when can anything be disclosed? So I think the bottom line is that, um, that really needs to be, um, you know, monitored closely. Um, of course, I think we would say it, entering into any negotiations with a license has to be really well thought out 
prior to doing that. As we saw, there are cases on both sides as to whether this may be used to say, I had the best of intentions and no good faith, you know, a good faith basis here. And on the other side, I know this shows a subjective intent and bad faith. So it's it can be a landmine there. Yeah, but I think that our, our viz, if you do the NDA right, it's it's a better tool than the 408 because the 408, uh, maybe it can be used to show that you had notice of the patent. It might not be able to show that, believe that you were liable or damages. So properly crafted NDA is probably a better tool in, in my view. Uh, finally, the one question is, uh, for a life sciences perspective, they often do FTOs, they're important. Uh, what level do they need to do this? Because some of these broad claims, particularly with uh, how written description and enablement is being dealt with these days, can be, can be uh, problematic for broad claims. So to, you know, what is the, the opinion I have to deal with? Uh, I know I have my in, insights on that, but Lisa, from a perspective, from the defendant's perspective, you know, how detailed must the opinion be? Does it have to touch on everything? Can you focus it down to really the, the nuggets that are the most problematic for the patent? And will that suffice to give you a reasonable basis uh, that you don't infringe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I do think, of course, as we saw there, the, the opinions are extremely important. Um, I think um, having a well-crafted opinion, and of course, the other part of the opinion is that it must be relied upon. So as we've seen with all these cases today, they're so factually dependent, but um, based on those facts of a strong opinion where the, um, you know, the attorney is appropriate with the appropriate background, has the appropriate information, and then the company relies upon it, can be so powerful. Uh, those, in many instances, are the cases where you win summary judgment of uh, no willfulness. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say that it, it is key. Um, and I, I imagine in to, to many companies, yes, these, these can be um, expensive, but the one way, as we're saying, you can craft this to be, um, you know, specific, for instance, you know, it doesn't have to cover everything. It can just go, for instance, to, you know, lack of written description and enablement. You, know, you can get a, a 112 opinion, for instance. Um, you know, it's it's key, I think, to just figure out what is the strongest argument um, uh, and, you know, put that forward in your opinion. Yeah. As long as the basis is well-founded, mm -hmm. I don't think you have to touch everything yeah. on the waterfront. Yeah. So I think we're at the two, I don't see any more questions and I think we're at the two hour mark. So I'll leave it to you, Lisa. Yes, Actually, yes, so, yes I think uh, we, we do wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So again, um, thank you so much for joining us. And um, as we say, we will be happy um, to provide you these slides um, and also the CLE, just uh, get in touch with us through the information that we provide. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone. Mm -hmm.